Here's the reason why it's hard to forgive people. We like to press the replay button because your mind, your emotions don't know the difference between reality and imagination. So this person sinned against you one time, but because you replayed it over and over and over and over and over again, instead of sinning once, he sinned a thousand times. And people say, I just don't know how to forgive. No, you don't know how to stop replaying it. That's the problem. Because every time you replay it, guess what you gotta do? You have to forgive. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for wisdom. Holy Spirit, just ask you to be on me and use me and speak through me today in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty. So, this is going to be part two of the art of peacemaking, how to deal with conflict and offenses. And so, we already have a teaching um, on our web, on our YouTube channel called the Art of Peacemaking, how to deal with conflict. And uh, probably going to read retitle that to part one and maybe do this in part two we'll see as we go I generally create my titles after we preach so <clears throat> we're gonna do a quick recap I preached this a couple times uh, and I only recorded it once so we're gonna do a recap because this was back what three or four months ago we preached it and I just need to I just need to finish the series up so <clears throat> we talked about uh, the single biggest reason for unhealthy conflict is, is rooted in misunderstanding. If we could seek to understand each other, we could resolve almost any conflict. I, really, I truly believe that that is the, the major problem, is that we just don't understand what's going on. Have you ever had anybody that talked about you, I talked about a friend of yours behind their back, you know, and... As they were talking, a part of you just wanted to go to their defense, right? Simply because they're your friend. You might even know that this person's got bad qualities. You might even say, this guy does have some of the personality quirks. But because you know them, you want to defend them. Does that make sense? Especially if they're a good friend. <clears throat> the reason why is because when we know each other, when we understand one another, we have more mercy. I'm going to write that down. When we understand, this, this one's art of peacemaking. When we understand someone, we tend to have more mercy. Uh, this, this program, the barracks, I've had people come to the barracks that did not know that I never struggled with drug and alcohol addictions. And I've had people say, well, see, they'll say, see, you understand. That's why you're doing this. And, I, and, and my problem was not drug and alcohol addictions. My problem was pornography addictions. So there was a level of understanding because I've been through the same struggle of just feeling like I have no self-control. I have, I cannot quit doing this or I hate myself because I'm doing this right so a lot of those same struggles a lot of those mental a lot of those mental struggles yes I can relate with but you know I, I don't know how meth affects the body personally right never went through all that so then how come people so badly want somebody to have walked the same path they went down and I believe it's not because uh, somebody who walked on the same path is more equipped to set someone free. I don't think that's the case. Here's the reason why I say that. Jesus Christ never sinned one time, but he set the whole world free. Okay? So you don't have to have done the same things to help somebody else get free. You just have to know the truth. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so I've helped a lot of guys who I've never went down the same exact road as them, but I helped them get free in their life. And the reason why was because I know the truth, and the truth makes you free. When, I, when, when the Lord called me into this ministry and asked me to, to do the barracks discipleship house, I told God, 
I said, but I never did drugs and alcohol. And the Holy Spirit told me, your testimony is not going to set anyone free, Zach. My word's going to set them free. I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> what people really are looking for is not someone who's been there. What they're actually looking for is someone who wants to understand them. What they actually think is, if they didn't do what I did, then how can they show me mercy? That's what they're scared of. They're nervous that someone's going to write them off. They're nervous that someone's not going to give them a chance. And so what happens is when you walk down the same path as somebody else, then you tend to be more understanding, right? And you have more mercy. So it's not whether or not I walked down the same exact path as somebody. Here's the truth. Here's what it is. It's not that. You're looking for somebody who will understand you. You're looking for somebody who will have mercy on you. You're looking for someone who will show you love. Why? The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. When we talk about the woman who came and washed Jesus' feet, the woman came and washed Jesus' feet, and Simon, he was in Simon's house. Simon was a Pharisee, okay? And Simon said in his heart, if Jesus knew, if this man was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman was there washing his feet. Let's find that passage. It's over in Luke chapter 7, verse 39. Let's go there. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume then she knelt beside him at his feet weeping her tears fell on his face on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them when the pharisee who had invited him saw this he said to him if this man were a prophet he would know what kind of woman is touching him she's a sinner then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he, watch this. Let's note a couple things real quick. One had 50 and one had 500. One had 50, one had a debt of 500. Watch this. Key, the key verse is verse 42. Luke 7, verse 42. This is the key verse of this parable. But neither of them could repay him. But neither of them could repay him. <clears throat> Watch this. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled a larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of, of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me lo much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Watch this. But a person who is forgiven little shows little love. Hmm. This is verse uh, 47. 
Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. All right, now, what I want to point out is two things. Verse 42 and verse 47. Everybody points to this one. The person who's forgiven little shows little love. The person who's being forgiven much shows much love. Everybody talks about that. But nobody talks about this one. But neither of them could repay him. Neither of them could repay. So which one's the greater debt? 50 or 500? <laughs> neither one's a greater debt. I always tell people this. Rich people have rich people problems and poor people have poor people problems. Okay? If you're poor and you can't afford 50 pieces of silver, then 50 is equal to you what 500 is equal to the rich person. Think about this for a second. Everybody, every, and when people hear these two numbers, they think from their perspective. They think from their paradigm. If you're a poor person, and I tell you that there's fifty dollars being that ne that needs to be paid back in a debt, and you have thousands of dollars in your bank account, then fifty dollars doesn't really mean very much. You see? Now I, let's not say thousands. Okay, let's just go back. Let's say that you have, let's say that you have fifty dollars in the bank. Okay, it's all relative. Okay, <clears throat> it's all relative. People only give what they're comfortable giving, right? So somebody who has only $700 in their bank account, they're not gonna give away $700. They might give away 50 bucks, right? It's more comfortable for them, right? They still have plenty left. So when people hear these concepts of 50 and 500, usually they think from their own perspective. Well, you know what, I got $500 in my bank. But that would eat up everything in my bank account. But if I owed $50, that wouldn't be that bad. See, it all depends on what your wealth is. This is how you, depending on your wealth and what you think you have, these numbers mean different to you. Does that make sense? <clears throat> if you have plenty of money, $500 might not be that bad. If you have only a little bit of money and you can barely pay your gas bill at your house, and filling up your tank full of gas in your car is difficult for you, then $50 is going to be a painful thing for you. See, the point is, neither of them could repay him. You know what the problem with Simon in this story is he thinks he can repay it. Those who've been forgiven little show little. You don't understand. The guy who owes 50 and can't pay back 50 to him... This will make him go bankrupt. To the guy who owes 500, I'm gonna tell you this right now, even now today, you can get what's called a credit score, right? You can't, if you're not good with paying off your debt, no one's gonna loan you 500. You know what this means? The guy who had 500 also previously paid off 50. So 50 wasn't a problem for him, but 500 was. You don't, you don't, you don't go, in, in the world of credit, you don't go up from 50 to 500 without paying off 50 first. He's already proved that he could pay the 50 off. But now he's in a situation where he can't pay off the 500. <clears throat> a little different perspective on this story, right? What's the difference here? He, Simon said, I guess the one who has the greater debt. Well, for Simon's situation, that was the right answer. Because you see, Simon doesn't understand the story. I bought my wife some washer and dryers. And some people thought that that wasn't a very good gift. Okay, let me give you some perspective here. I bought my, my, it's so funny. As a minister, I'm not supposed to make a ton of money, apparently. <laughs> right? So if I go to some people and I tell them, oh, I bought, a, I bought a, a pair of washer and dryers, people will, here's what people will do. People will say, oh, he must be getting rich off the ministry. How did he afford that washer and dryer? Okay, there's some people like that. 
And then there's other people when I told them, I bought a washer and dryer for my wife for Mother's Day, okay? Which for me, when I said that, it wasn't supposed to be a boast. It was supposed to be a recognition of my wife saying, you know, my wife is a good wife and happy Mother's Day and I bought this gift for her. But there were some people out there who thought that that wasn't a good gift for Mother's Day for whatever reason from their paradigm of thinking. What they don't know is that a year ago I went to India and in India they don't have washers and dryers. The people there can't afford a washer and dryer. $400 for a washer would pay for their monthly expenses for two months. So the woman, the, the, the wife of the pastor there who washed my clothes when I was there for 39 days, she hand washed my clothes. But that's not it. She hand washes clothes every day for her family. This is a normal life for her. She asked me last year if, we, if, if, I, if I would raise money to buy her a washer. And my response was, well, I mean, I got to take some time to do that, right? But when you look at that perspective, and then I have people respond back with snide remarks about my washer purchase, it makes me think to myself, why aren't we grateful for what we have? The reason why we're not grateful for what we have is because we don't hand wash our clothes. <laughs> In frustration, of course, I was happy to buy this gift for my wife, but you know, I'm just gonna pull back the veil a little bit. <clears throat> I was explaining to her, I said, I can't believe that people aren't, Sarah was thankful, okay? But I was explaining to her the situation. I, is, this is not a right. We, we, we take for, air, for granted air conditioning. and We take for granted washers and dryers. We take for granted having a vehicle. There's people out there that simply can't afford it, right? They just can't do it. We live in a very rich country. You, the, if you're the poorest in, the, in our country and you live in a house, you're in the top 1% richest people in the world. If you own a car, if you own a car, you're in the top 1% richest people in the world. Caesar is the top 1% one, 1 richest people in the world. <laughs> and he has no money <laughs> or house, <laughs> but he has a car, so he's the top 1%, all right? Look at this for a second. She was happy, but I explained to her, I said, so the water, what we don't, what, what, what could we have done? Instead of buying a washer. You know what we could have done? We could have still even had a washer. Just slung the hose over the side because the valve had broken. That's why I wasn't letting water come through. I could have just unhooked the hose, threw the hose over into the hole, and filled up the thing with water every day. You see what I'm saying? We could have saved the money and done it like that for the next 20 years. I mean, if you think about it, if I'm in India and I can't afford to get a... Man, that would be a dream. Right? Perspective. 50 and 500 is perspective. If you were in India, 50 is 500. You see? <laughs> if you're in America, 500 is... Uh, is it, am I making sense? It's all about the way we perceive the debt. Okay? So we're talking about how we... Do people have to go down the same road? It, no, I don't have to go down the same road you went. What I have to recognize is the gravity of my sin. That was the problem with Simon. Simon was just as bad of a sinner as that woman. But he didn't see himself that way. And here's the problem. People who have a hard life because of sin in their life, they think that somehow they're worse of a sinner than I am. I mean, they'll look at you and they'll say, well, all sin is the same. They'll say that, but they don't believe that. Even the people who are what we call the worst sinners, so-called the worst sinners, even they don't believe that their sin's less than someone else who didn't have it as bad as they did. That's why they wear it like a badge of honor. Think about that. 
Well, you haven't been down the road I went down, right? Wait a minute, I thought all sin was the same. Don't treat me any different then. I'm not going to treat you any different. <laughs> if you want me to love and respect you, not having gone down the same exact road you do, then love and respect what I have to tell you, even though I never went down the same exact road as you did. Because what I have to give you is life. You see? It's not my story that sets someone free. It's not your story that sets someone free. It's the Word of God that sets someone free. It's the truth. See? Why am I getting set free? Because I recognize my sin. That's it. Recognize my sin, and I put my faith in Christ for forgiveness of my sins. That's what makes me qualified to tell you the good news. Not my road of sin. Why am I telling you all this? Because of peacemaking. We're talking about peacemaking. Okay? Seeking to understand one another. The way we seek to understand one another is we first begin with recognizing our own shortcomings. Let me say that again. The beginning of the road to understanding one another. The beginning of the road to understanding one another. I'm going to write this down. <clears throat> the beginning of the road to understanding one another is to first recognize my own shortcomings. Self-awareness, humility. The beginning of the road to understanding one another is to first recognize my own shortcomings, becoming self-aware and humbling myself because he who has been forgiven much loves much. What people are looking for is love. They're not looking for someone who's been down the same road as them. They're duped. Because too often someone who's been down the same road as them hasn't made it back out. Unfortunately. This is why we conglomerate with people that are like us. And we don't ever find freedom. Think about that for a second. <laughs> this is a really blatant, this is a really generic way of saying things, okay? So what I'm about to say, please don't take it out of context or whatever. Just be understanding of it. But the sinners go where the sinners go, right? Why? Because they want to be understood. <clears throat> Everybody goes to the bar. Because that's where all the people like them are. The people that will understand them, Right? Everybody wants to tell their story. But unfortunately, everybody's going there and they don't have the answer. That's why they're still going there. What you have to do is you have to hunger and thirst for truth more than you hunger and thirst for people that are like you. You need to hunger and thirst for truth more than you hunger for being around people that are like you. What you actually are looking for is somebody who is self-aware. You're looking for somebody who's humble. <clears throat> You're looking for somebody who will love you because love covers a multitude of sins. This is the beginning of peacemaking. This is the beginning of peacemaking. I haven't even gotten to the stinking notes yet. <laughs> At all. <clears throat> because this truly is the beginning of peacemaking. If you want to have relationships that are healthy, you have to first become self-aware of your own sin. You have to realize that your job, watch this for a second. You know what the difference between the woman who washed Jesus' feet and the man, Simon, the Pharisee? What's the difference between them? It wasn't the size of their debt. The difference was the woman compared her life to Jesus. Simon compared his life to the woman. The woman compared her life to Jesus. She looked at her debt and then she looked at Jesus' debt. And she realized that she was the 500. If Simon had looked at himself and compared himself to Jesus, he also would have seen himself as the 500, not the 50. But we always get in trouble 
when we compare ourselves to others rather than comparing ourselves to God. This is powerful stuff. We always get ourselves in trouble when we compare ourselves to people, other people, rather than God. This is the reason why people who don't go to church because of all the hypocrites in the church are guilty of being a Pharisee. <clears throat> That's what Jesus said. He says, don't be like that Pharisee. He says, he's, look at, let's look at this story real quick. Look at this for a second. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a, was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee took, stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest. In sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We can all, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're at, we can all be guilty of the Pharisee, of being a Pharisee. You don't have to have the robes or the education to be a Pharisee. You just have to think you're better than somebody else in any way. If you think you're justified, you're not. It's when you realize you don't deserve it. That's humble. Look, it's the, the key is humbleness. When we're humble before the Lord, God will exalt us. This is why the people outside of church, who don't go to church because of all the sinners in the church. Think about that for a second. They're equal to a Pharisee. They think the Pharisees are inside the church. The Pharisees are outside the church just as much. I'm not saying that there aren't Pharisees in church. But what I am saying is there's a whole lot of them outside the church too. People who know to do good, but they don't do good. They're outside the church. Saying, look at all them sinners in the church. That's why I don't go to church, because all them people in the church. And they want to blame, blame, blame. They're doing exactly what Jesus said right here. I thank you, God, that I'm not like that tax collector over there. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not like that churchgoer over there. And then they think somehow that by, that, by them doing what they're doing, they're justifying their actions, but they're not. The one who gets exalted is the one who humbles himself. I put a post the other day on Facebook, Jesus loves sinners so much he even ate with tax collectors and Pharisees. <laughs> oh, who was the chief of sinners? The Pharisees? Jesus ate with them. And we have a problem going to church. Because all of them Pharisees. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He humbled himself. He was looking for truth. Powerful stuff. Single biggest reason for unhealthy conflict is rooted in misunderstanding. Misunderstanding. The first thing we misunderstand is that we're sinners. The first thing we misunderstand is that I need forgiveness. That's the first thing we misunderstand. Once we realize... I need forgiveness, then it's easy to forgive other people. When you realize you owe God a life debt and somebody else just took about 60 seconds of your life, or even a day, 24 hours, let's say they took 24 hours, let's say they took 15 years of your life, you owe God a life debt. So it still doesn't weigh. Whenever Jesus forgave me of my life debt, it makes it easier for me to forgive others. Check this out. The reason why we don't forgive is because, look at for a second, listen. <clears throat> if you had a bunch of bills that were due, can I erase this? Hmm? Yes. If you had a bunch of bills due, right? Oh no, the bills are due. I mean, think about this for a minute. We're going through this crisis of the corona, right? Nobody has their jobs, right? Everybody's losing their jobs. The government sent out some stimulus checks, right? But think about this for a minute. Everybody's freaking out. The bills are due on the 4th. So we're going to go around and we should start collecting. Why are we collecting? If you have a debt to pay, can you forgive other people? You can't forgive debt. If you have a debt, you can't forgive debt because you have a debt to pay. 
You have bills due. Son, you better pay up, man. I got bills to pay. So this is why. Why? Fear driven. It's fear driven. We make, watch this. Us demanding others pay us back is fear driven because we owe a debt. What if all of a sudden all your debts were canceled and you didn't have to owe nothing? You didn't have any bills due on the 4th. It was all gone. All of a sudden, all your credit card debts was, was forgiven. All your, your car payment was forgiven. Your house payment was forgiven. You had nothing to pay. Would you go around demanding everybody else pay up? There wouldn't be a reason to because nothing's due. We're talking about something much deeper than money. We don't demand other people pay up when we don't have anything due for ourselves. When your debt's been forgiven, there's no reason to go collect. Such a good word. When your debt's been forgiven, there's no reason to go collect. You're a free man. When you realize that everything you have has been given to you, nobody owes you anything. When you realize everything has been given to you, nobody, nobody owes you anything. I'm gonna talk about I'm gonna talk about some things we talked about in the past we never got it recorded, so can I erase this? I got this. When we realize everything has been given to us, there's no then nobody owes you anything. Alright. I believe, you know, people say, well, I just don't know how to, I believe forgiveness is easy. Here's why I believe forgiveness is easy. Forgiveness is easy when I realize how much I've been forgiven and I realize that what people have done to me will never outweigh what I've done to God. That's why it's easy for me. Why then is it hard to forgive somebody? Here's the reason why it's hard to forgive people. We like to press, press the replay button. Right? The re is that the replay button? <laughs> we like to press the replay button. Replay. So somebody did something to you one time, but then every day you think about it. Every day. You dwell on it. You meditate on it. Every day you replay it multiple times a day. So they didn't, did you know your brain, listen, your brain <clears throat> doesn't know the difference. Let's say your emotions. Your emotions don't know the difference. Your emotions don't know the difference between reality and imagination. This is why you can do a nice, beautiful drama, add some sappy music behind it, and you start busting a tear. I still remember reading the book, Where the Red Fern Grows, in third grade. An imaginary story. When those dogs died, I, I cried my eyes out. I still remember watching Old Yeller as a kid and when they had to put down the rabid dog. I cried like a little baby. <clears throat> our emotions don't know the difference between reality and our imagination. Which is why replaying Someone's offense in my life is so dangerous. Because your mind, your emotions, don't know the difference between reality and imagination. So this person sinned against you one time, but because you replayed it over and over and over and over and over again, instead of sinning once, he sinned a thousand times. It's like hammering it in and hammering it in and hammering it in. I believe that the measure that you people say, I just don't know how to forgive. 
I don't know how to forgive it. No, you don't know how to stop replaying it. That's the problem. Because every time you replay it, guess what you got to do? You have to forgive them again. Every time you replay it, you have to forgive them again. So what you do is you, when you replay it, forgive them. Then you need to stop thinking about this and you need to start thinking about God's goodness in your life. I remember working when I was getting irritable over at when I was CC's Pizza. I mean, I, I just wanted to fire everybody, man. I was just about to ready to get fired everybody. Eventually, I did almost fire. I pretty much had fired everybody, but that was after I wrote some laws. But before then, I was just gonna, I was just gonna get rid of everybody right then. I was done. When people were disrespectful, all kinds of stuff, right? I just hit, fed up, had enough, and I went outside, took a breath. I said, "God, all right, I need some help." And the Lord just told me, how much have I forgiven you? And I just, it just deflated me. <laughs> I said, okay, Lord, just help me love them. Help me forgive them. Help me not hold people's past against them. Love does not keep a record of wrong. Powerful stuff. <clears throat> In the measure that you replay is the measure you have to forgive. This is why the Bible says, don't think about such things, but dwell on... Let's find that scripture verse. Think about these things. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Look, let's go back up. Mm. <laughs> this is how wonderful the, word, the Lord works. Look at this. We're talking about peacemaking, right? Let's go up to Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. Watch this. Now I appeal to Eodia and Sintik, Sintik, whatever their names are. Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. He was writing to two people that were fighting about something. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my own co-workers, those na whose names are written in the book of life. Watch this. Now, he's still talking to the same people. Always be full of joy. Wait a minute. <laughs> Always be full of joy. What? what? Is that even possible? Yes, it is. Or he wouldn't tell you to do it. Always be full of joy. If you're not full of joy, then you've forgotten. Always be full of joy. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Iota and Sintik. I don't know how you say their names. He's writing to the, to the Philippians, okay? But he's talking to two people who are arguing and fighting. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice. You know what rejoice means? <clears throat> it's the same thing as replaying that sin that someone did against you. How, 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 do, we, how do we get back in the dumps again? Oh, I, I remembered what that person did to me. You're replaying the sin. You're replaying the offense, whatever they did to you, right? Now you're back in the dumps. Now you're back in bitterness. Now you're back in irritability. You're now you're back in hatred and anger. Why? Because you thought about again, after forgiving them, now you're back to thinking about it again, and now you have to forgive them again. <clears throat> but because you keep going back, you're not rejoicing. You're re-depressing.
You're re-saddening. You're re-angering. You're re-hatred. You're re-hating. You see? Why? It's about what you think about. The key is about what you think about. What are we dwelling upon? What am I meditating on? Am I meditating on the things that happened to me in the past? Remember, your emotions don't know the difference between reality and your imagination. So it says right here, always be full of joy. How, Paul? I don't know how to always be full of joy every day. How do I wake up happy? If you don't wake up happy, then that means you forgot. I tell people this all the time. Grumpiness is illegal in my house. Because <laughs> you didn't wake up thankful. Watch this. Always be full of joy. Man, that is such a bold statement. Paul, you just don't understand. He does understand, actually. He understands how to have joy. What you don't understand is how not to have joy. You don't understand how to have joy. It's a powerful word. Maybe we should go to Paul. Who could have easily been tormented the rest of his life for all the people he killed. PTSD. Think about that. How did Paul always remain in joy? He's about to tell us. Always be full of joy, verse 4. So we're in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. We're gonna, we actually started this all the way back in verse 2. And we're going to be going all the way to verse 9. Always be full of joy. How? How? Watch this. Again, I say, rejoice. Re. You probably already connected all the dots by now. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Rejoice means to remember the good stuff. People who are stuck in depression don't know how to remember the good stuff. How do we... Okay, all right, now it says right here, always be joy, full of joy. I said again, rejoice. Remember the good stuff. Verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead... Pray about everything. How do, you, how do you not worry about anything? Verse 6 says, the answer is, pray about everything. Look at this. Don't worry. The answer is, pray. So good. Simple. Tell God what you need. And thank him for all he has done. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Tell God what you need and then thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. People are like, I just can't get any peace. Do you know how you can get peace? Don't worry. Pray. Tell God what you need. And thank him for all he's done. You want to get peace? <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you right now. People want peacemaking in their relationships, but the first part you need to start out with is peace in yourself. How can you have peace in your relationships if you don't have peace in yourself? It's good stuff. I'm about to preach. <laughs> look, look, look at this. Look, look, look at this. Don't worry about anything. This is verse Philippians chapter... Still in Philippians, chapter 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. 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 Any. And, and does this say that there's some things you can worry about? And then there's some things you shouldn't worry No, it says don't worry about anything. <laughs> I'm telling you. Throw that away. Don't worry about anything. So good. Anything. Instead, pray about everything. Pray. Wait a minute. About everything. Look at this for a second. Don't worry about anything. And then it says pray about everything. How much stuff should you worry about? 
Nothing. Then how much stuff should you pray about? Everything. We should pray about literally everything. Everything. Not just the things you are anxious about. <laughs> Tell God what you need. Step one, step two, step three, and thank him for all he has done. Look at this. So how do we get rid of... Oh. How do we get rid of our anxiety? How to get inner peace? How to get inner peace? Step one, don't worry about anything. Step two, pray about everything. Step three, tell God what you need. Step four, thank him for all he's done. And the answer says, then the peace from God. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Look at this for a second. He's talking to these people, Yoda, not Yoda like, you know, the green guy, but e a o u do do do, and Cintiq. He says, look, settle so your disagreement. And then he says, how do you do it? Always be joyful. Rejoice. Stop thinking about all the bad stuff and focus on the good stuff. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do, right? And then it says, the reason why, well, James, the book of James says, why do you have quarrels and fights among you? It says, is it not? Look at this. James chapter 4, verse 3. Look at this. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? What is causing the, the quarrels and fights among you? Do they not come from evil desires at war within you? You want, but you do not have. You scheme, so you kill. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it, uh, take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't do it because... You don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what you give for your own pleasures. Look at this. Don't worry about anything, right? Then you will experience the peace which exceeds everything we can understand. Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Watch this. Here's the answer. Here's how you get peace. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Before we can seek peace with others, we have to have inner peace. <clears throat> Before we can make peace with others, we have to have inner peace. Inner peace. He's saying here in James, why do you fight and quarrel among you? Is it not because the desires are at war within you, right? Inside, why are we fighting on the outside? It's because on the inside we're fighting. We can't get peace on the inside. Again, these anxieties cause us to be Touchy, right? Think about that. We talked about this yesterday in one of our teachings. We have the infection on our body and somebody brushes up against us. They don't even know what's going on, but there's something about us that's wrong and we take it out on them. You see? We can't truly have peace with other people until we have inner peace on the inside. So if you find somebody you've been trying to make peace with over and over and over and they just can't seem to get it and y'all just can't get on the same page, do look, your job is to dig deep. If you love them, your job is to say, hey, you don't have inner peace. What's going on? 
Otherwise, you resort to name calling. I know, look, my wife and I are married. We don't have a perfect, we have, we have had fights. I remember one time, you know, I'm trying to, to plan and strategize, and Sarah's just so, I mean, she just cuts everything down. It's just, I mean, it was not, no peace. I'm like, I hate talking to you, right? <laughs> just being real. I hate talking to you about it. And, and what ended up happening, we were talking about growing our team, okay? Here's what happened. We were talking about growing our team. I was trying to have a peaceful conversation, help us grow, help us go forward in life, help us move on. And it was just like everything, bam, I mean, just bam. I mean, she just, it, she wasn't having it. And she was fighting me. Next thing you know, I'm, I get a little fleshy. I, I know everybody thinks Zach's perfect, but I'm not perfect. <laughs> I mean, I, I got, I mean, I, I, I feel bad right now about this. I, I resorted to name calling. I'm not perfect. I'm teaching about peacemaking here. I'm not perfect. Name calling. Next thing you know, she just starts breaking down crying. Of course, now I'm trying to figure out what's going on, right? Because I thought we were, I thought we were okay with this fight, you know? I was like, <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, first of all, let me just say, I repented for that. You know, I'm not perfect. We make mistakes. We repented for those things. But what ended up happening was I found out that Sarah didn't have a problem with me. She wasn't fighting me. She was fighting herself. And here I was taking it personal. You know what she was scared about? Getting backstabbed by another person. And here I was thinking that she was just being rebellious towards me and she hated me and she I thought she was against me she wasn't against me she just didn't know she didn't have this she didn't have inner peace on herself I was trying to have a conversation with someone who was broken you see so of course She's got an infection she's dealing with. And I'm touching on it. And she don't want to have it. And I'm thinking she's just mad at me. She's not mad at me. Even though she was mad at me. She didn't know why she was mad at me. Finally, we got down to the bottom of it. Thank you, Jesus. And she had to figure out that she was just in pain. And she didn't want to go through all that again. And I could understand that. Of course, then I had to repent. I felt so bad about what I said to her. We made peace. But we had to get down to this. We had to realize that it wasn't often. Listen, the, the, the greatest reason for bad conflict is because of lack of understanding. If you start getting in an argument with somebody and you don't really, and it's confusing to you, especially if it's confusing to you, and you're just like, I don't know why this is a problem. You're like, I'm so confused right now. Why am I in a bubble of confusion right now? You need to dig deep if you love your friend, whoever you're in conflict with. And you need to figure out, hold on a minute, what's going on? Have you ever tried to screw a screw into the hole, into the wall where drywall was? And it stripped out the hole, right? And you couldn't ever put the, the screw back in the same hole again. You have to get an anchor, right? You gotta get an anchor, fill the hole up, then you can put the screw in and it'll hold tightly, okay? Which is the way you're supposed to do it in the first place. That's the way our hearts are. Everybody needs an anchor. Otherwise, when you start hanging your shelves, it ain't gonna hold. They're gonna come ripping right out of the drywall.
We have to have an anchor. We have to have peace on the inside. We have to be able to hold on to something. So anytime you get, when you start getting into a peacemaking situation, you need to figure out what's going on in their heart. First, make sure they have inner peace. This is why when Jesus rebuked the storm, Again, I feel really bad about name calling. I, let me go back to that. I, I, <laughs> I don't resort to name calling usually. This was a very rare situation, but I was extremely frustrated. Obviously, I had some inner peace problems too, right? And I had to fix those inner peace problems in myself, right? Why was I allowing that situation? Possibly because maybe at the time I wasn't spending time with God. I didn't have my peace. If I had spending, been spending time with God and getting my anchor down properly, right? If I had put my peace, if I, put, if I had rested in, in Christ for everything, right? And I wasn't anxious about anything, but I was praying about everything. Well, maybe I wouldn't have been so frustrated with Sarah. You see? I could have been more understanding. I could have been more patient. Yesterday we talked about the victim mentality. The creator in that story, you know, who doesn't want to play the victim in his life, he realizes the only way to change the world around him is to change himself. Right? The only way to change the world around you is to change yourself. So if I'm not happy with how things are going in my life, the first place I should start is with me, not with anybody else. If I had been spending time with God in my quiet time, in prayer, reading my scriptures and staying connected to the vine, then I could have discerned immediately, much quicker, what was going on in my wife's heart. And I never would have let it get to that point where I was calling names. Right? So, we have to take ownership for our lives. We have to be able to look into those things. Make sense? So, I think I pretty much ran out of time today. It's a good word. Jesus is awesome. I was taken over by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, because I never even got one time to my notes. The only thing I read on this paper was this very top line. <laughs> God is good, huh? Well, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Well, thank you, Father, for, Father, for your word. And help us all, Father. None of us are perfect. We all fall short in peacemaking. Lord, help us make peace with you first. Help us make peace in our hearts with you so we don't have this inner war in our hearts so that when we deal with people, we can be loving and understanding and patient. And we won't feel like a rubber band that's already been stretched too far, just ready to snap because we've come to you, Lord, and we've relaxed. And then when other people put stress on us, we're able to hold. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we can all be better friends, better husbands, better brothers. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll, be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your newsfeed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boulders Line Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day